Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Catalina Oida. Hello, um, and welcome to the second half of, second half or post-lunch uh, part of the Earth Covering Centennial, AGU Centennial Celebration. Um, my name is Carolina Oida. I am one of the early career members on the AGU Council. Uh, in fact, I'm one of six student and early career um, scientists on the Council. Uh, and I mention this because I do want to thank um, the AGU leadership and Council, as well as AGU staff, for not only recognizing the value that um, student and early career scientists bring, can and do bring um, to the earth science, earth and space science community, um, but also for supporting and creating opportunities um, for us to be engaged and active. Um, <clears throat> as we were actually planning, um, as we were all like sitting together and planning for this, for this day, we were brainstorming themes and who should speak, uh, what should we do, and in fact, one of the members um, of that committee, who is not a student early career, and I won't name any names, um, said at one point that, well, let's think about who will be the community that drives our science <clears throat> into the coming decades. And so the answer is it'll probably be one of the student early career scientists, so we should highlight them throughout the, any, discussion, throughout any discussion of um, the future that we might have and future directions. And so with that, this is now you're getting, that's kind of how the um, <clears throat> young scientist view of the future was born, uh, the session that you find yourselves in today. And hopefully you came here not by accident. <laughs> um, but we have a great lineup. And so for the next hour, you will be hearing from eight such young scientists representing roughly the eight sections that make up the earth covering neighborhood. Um, and, but they're also representing diverse perspectives, uh, covering a large and broad um, range of insights and ideas. And so without uh, any further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, who is Liz Separately. Um, and I'll take her, I'll let her take the mic and the stage. Thank you, Catalina. Um, my name is Liz Separley. Um, I'm a geologist. Um, I recently completed my PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and now I'm an vi assistant visiting professor at Oberlin College. Um, and so today, I just wanted to share um, a technique uh, using cosmogenic nuclides to understand past climate change um, by looking at how large and small past ice sheets were. Um, and I think this is one technique that, as a as a solid earth um, surficial processes um, person that's interested in leveraging the wealth of deposits we have on earth, we can use that um, to tie it with the complex climate models that um, are always being developed. Um, so just a little background. Um, uh, our earth transitioned from um, a hothouse climate into an ice house climate over the last 65 million years. Um, and this led to the development of the two ice sheets that we have today, um, Antarctica for about the last 35 million years, um, and Greenland for the last eight million years. Um, along with that, the Laurentide ice sheet in the last two and a half million years. Um, and so the impetus for my talk is to kind of show you by, by using sediment and landforms from these past ice sheets, we can understand how um, these ice sheets disappeared in the past. So whether it was fast or slow, if there are different sectors of the ice sheets behaving in different ways. And I just want to introduce or showcase this one um, method that I think um, can, we can really capitalize on in the future. Um, so this curve is the, is the famous Zakos et al. 2001 curve, um, uh, mostly composed of oxygen isotope measurements um, from marine cores around the world, from benthic forams um, in the cores. If we look specifically um, at the quaternary period, so the last two and a half million years, we can see that there were large glacial, interglacial uh, fluctuations. So the question is, at what point did Greenland completely disappear during this time? Um, most of this fluctuation is driven by the Laurentide ice sheet. And I realize all the places that I've gone to school and I teach at are underneath the former Laurentide ice sheet. <laughs> and it doesn't work in California, but <laughs> it works pretty well. Um, for visualizing it in the Midwest. Um, so when did Greenland um, completely disappear during these, the last two and a half million years? Um, 
And one thing we can do is we can leverage um, terrestrial deposits um, that contain these special isotopes that can record erosion during this time. Um, one uh, time period in particular um, that you probably are aware of that people are interested in looking at is the uh, the mid-Pliocene warm period. Um, so that was three to 3.3 million years ago. And this is what's considered an analogous to what um, we're heading into today or what we're already in today. So CO2 is about the same as today. Sea level was higher than it is today. And so climate modelers are trying to estimate how did the ice sheet reduce during that size to a complete disappearance of the Greenland ice sheet and how did it grow after. So this is a, um, a great paper by Ning Tan um, that modeled the evolution of the Greenland ice sheet. So you can see it doesn't start um, in the highest point on Greenland, which is in the center. It might have started in the south and, and migrated north as it grew in volume. So this is um, a model perspective of it. But in order to get a terrestrial perspective of it, we can use um, cosmogenic isotopes um, that are preserved in marine sediment. Um, so most of my work for my dissertation used these isotopes in boulders, um, but I think one resource that we can leverage is the wealth of, of marine sediment out there. So cosmogenic isotopes um, are high energy particles that accumulate in rock surfaces in the upper five centimeters or so. We can actually measure them. Um, other than that, they're always whizzing around our atmosphere and passing through um, solids, um, but they actually get stuck in minerals. Um, and so the mineral quartz is really useful because it's pretty easy to isolate and easy to work with. Um, and because of the half-life of some of these isotopes, we can actually measure um, all the way back to seven million years ago. And so if you remember, um, Greenland's been fluctuating in and out for the last eight million years. And so this could give us a good estimate of uh, the rate of variability of growth if we could have like a, a network of cores around all of Greenland. Um, so I think this, my perspective is this is just one of these tools that is gonna be, should be capitalized on and, and leveraged in the future. Um, there's a couple different cosmogenic isotopes and if you pair two together, such as beryllium and aluminum, you can get information about erosion rates um, from the land. So it's not giving you um, an age per se, such as a, a boulder would um, that a glacier left behind, but it's giving you a rate of change. And so this has been used in a couple studies. Um, for example, uh, Beerman et al. in 2016, they used cores from East Greenland, off the coast of East Greenland, and they found that there has been a dynamic East Greenland ice sheet for the last seven million years. So perhaps the ice sheet hadn't completely disappeared during the mid-Pleistocene warm period. So maybe in the future, we might still have this kind of ice cap in East Greenland. And so most of um, these models, like in that figure, they are, are grounded on the sub-ice topography, um, and then they're kind of calibrated with um, some of the offshore data. But the offshore data is very sparse um, today, whereas we actually have cores from all over the world. So, these two kind of data sets need to be combined in the future. Um, another study found that only 45% uh, of Greenland was covered with ice in the last one million years. So this means that there were huge expanses of Greenland that were ice-free during those glacial and interglacial cycles. Um, Schaefer et al. Uh, 2016 uh, measured isotopes actually in the bedrock core underneath the um, grip ice core site. And so, and they found that it was, exposed to the atmosphere at some point prior to the last interglacial. So in terms of grand, challenging, grand challenges, I think we can leverage these existing um, and hopefully future records of erosion and sediment change coming off of Greenland to kind of estimate how ice sheets like this are gonna um, retreat in the future and where sites um, that may be a surprising place that haven't been predicted to be ice free in the future. Um, and in terms of uh, leveraging this colder climate, uh, for example, um, leveraging the cold climate for server farms, there's this great article that I want to highlight in Nature that's uh, more of a perspective um, by Julia Rosen. Um, and she goes into all these different opportunities that might be available in Greenland if we can accurately predict 
where the ice will retreat next. For example, hydro, power, server farms, and also, of course, mining. So underneath the Greenland ice sheet, it's fairly unknown lithology, except what has been correlated with the coastal areas. So I think that um, if we can accurately predict the spatial variability of the retreating ice sheet, that could be a great um, resource in the future. So that is all. Thank you. <laughs>
We also know that some the, well, plants have different mechanisms to cope with nutrient limitations. So some plants, for example, associate with ectomycorrhizal fungi. These fungi are the fungi that come for mushrooms, and these fungi are really good in taking nitrogen from organic sources that would be not available for, for, for plant roots without these fungi. And because plants are good at, at taking, fixing carbon, and the fungi are good at, at, at taking nitrogen, they exchange carbon for nitrogen in a symbiotic relationship. We found that the plants that associate with these ectomycorrhizal fungi are much better at taking CO2 and, and increasing their, their biomass in response to elevated CO2 compared to plants that do not associate with this ectomycorrhizal fungi. So taking into account all these uh, environmental relationships of plant growth with soil nutrients in the context of CO2 experiments, we have upscaled the future effect of, of CO2 on plant biomass that we could expect by the end of this century. And we found that an overall effect of CO2 of about 12%, which is equivalent to 59 petagrams of carbon. So next we have compare the future CO2 fertilization effect that we derive from experiments for the future with, with the past CO2 fertilization effect that we have already experienced in recent decades as simulated by, by global models. Although we still need to make, um, to make comparis uh, a better, a more direct comparison between models and observations, where these results suggest that in the future plants might uh, increase, that there might be a decrease in the amount of, of CO2 that they can put into biomass, which is not good news. So in, in synthesis, we, it, it, both theory and evidence suggest the current alleviation of rates of climate change through the action of vegetation. But the future of this ecosystem service is uncertain. Our synthesis of CO2 experiments suggests that the potential of future plants to remove CO2 from the atmosphere might be lower than previously thought. So another way to put it is, if you think of CO2 as a greenhouse gas that is warming the planet, plants can remove part of this CO2 and convert it into plant biomass. The problem is that the CO2 fertilization effect is strongly regulated by soil nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, which might become more, much further constrained this, this effect in the future. Therefore, we need to curb CO2 emissions drastically as soon as possible, because otherwise we might enter an uncertain and perhaps irreversible scenario for, for the climate. We must also protect natural ecosystems and to guarantee that future plants will be able to remove, help us remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabby Langendijk. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Gabi Langrijk. I was previously at the WCRP and WMO as a scientific officer, and I'm currently a PhD candidate at the Climate Service Center Germany. And um, they asked me to, to kind of prepare a talk around the future of the Earth's habitability. So, and my own research is on urban climate change, so I thought this was a good match. So I will kind of uh, focus my um, talk around that. Let's see, I think this slider is not too quick. But uh, my next slide is showing Climate change, it's there, and now after some like 40 to 100 years maybe already of research, it really shows clear evidence that human-induced climate change is real. I know that we're in a society where there might be some politically uh, um, doubt, but uh, I think the science shows very, very clear evidence. And that science also led us in 2015 to this landmark agreement, the Paris Agreement, where actually you could see that science underpinned the political discourse and actually changed the political discourse in acknowledging that um, climate change and human climate change uh, exist and really there's an urgency to act right now and that's exactly where our generation is going to deal with. We have to act and we have to define the ways forward 
We have to develop the solutions and deal with the impact and also mitigate the impact as much as possible. But it leaves our generation, as an early career perspective, leaves that with a really grand, grand task. And also, it really wonders how we can do this. There are many diverse opinions on how to do this. <laughs> and it still is a mystery. It will stay a secret. Now there's some more. Um, so it was interesting, a couple of months ago, the economist kind of put forward the first climate issue. It was uh, slightly controversial. There were a lot of comments after that on how are you going to address climate change that was not very much accepted by the economist uh, traditional uh, community. But um, they did outline very much the science in the beginning, which was did a, they did a great job. But then also they put uh, quite some editorials and per perspectives that said that capitalism would still be the correct way forward in the views of the economists. Then um, the IPCC came with a few special reports in the last few years, and they, one of the reports really got, got attention that we should eat less meat, so we should really change our diets. What should we change? But then if you actually ask people, which you see here, a nice survey on the left bottom, uh, there was a survey among German citizens that thought that if you have less plastic bags, that would be the best way to reduce our CO2 emissions. Which if you go look at the actual CO2 emissions of the plastic bags, it's not that much compared to other um, things in society that can be changed. So perceptions of the public are very different. And then of course we have this huge social movement that actually is requiring this system change or they ask for a system change. So the, the opinions are widely diverse. What are we going to do with these opinions as a science community? I think there is a need for science to really provide and develop this robust knowledge that we can enable this evidence-based decision-making is more needed than ever. And then, where do we need it? I think we need that everywhere around the world. But one place where we particularly need it is our cities, because that is where we live. That is where the people are, are the hearts of our society. And they're, of course, highly dependent on everything around us, but they are going to feel the impacts very, very big. Like they're all these people living there, there will be floods, water availability, food security, they're all major, major issues. And we need science-based information to actually make some good decisions in this aspect. What kind of things can we do? I didn't want to present something of my own science here, actually. I was uh, more thinking in some grand challenges that might be here that we as uh, early career scientists are going to face in the future. And these are a few things for the more science component that I think really need more research. So there's a big climatology and weather uh, community that's called Urban Climate Community, and they are really focused already for 45, 50 years on the process understanding. Of course, we further have to enhance this. But we also really have to make sure that we have more impact-based research. What are the impacts, actually, of this urban climate setting? And we need to connect it to climate change scenarios. It's still a very, it's very separate community, so we really need to try to ha have these communities combined so how can we actually say what this climate change is, is going to happen um, in the urban areas? So we need um, to have this kind of intercomparison between the model approaches, and we try to find maybe some typologies. Can we see that in certain cities the same thing happens than in other cities around the world? And then, of course, we're going to develop some policy and planning measures, hopefully. And then we need to evaluate them. Were they effective? Do they work? In 10 or 20 years, the people will come after us and they will say, we implement this policy, you said it would be good, what did it actually do? So we need to prepare for that kind of questions as well in the next decade. And how to do this with the society? Um, we need to really find a way to become more effective in bringing this data to information, to knowledge and applications. There is one sketch from a paper that um, me and a very big group of early career researchers have been publishing this year, where we really propose also this interactive approach, where you have iterative dialogues with the people, a continuous and evolving narratives that actually are updated when new knowledge is there. Um, really put this information and knowledge in the decision-making context. How can we have like trust facilitators build a relationship with people? How can you bring the knowledge to the table on an equal footing, so not just as a scientist bringing in your expertise, but work together? Um, and then really try to answer, but also generate the user needs that we think are needed for the future. Um, then one way to do this is to build more of the science and society institute. So how, to, how can we really integrate the scientific components in societal 
uh, institutions. And if you come, if you put this kind of together, there's a big need for urban climate services um, that bring together and enhance our understanding on urban climate change and really try to underpin this transformation. So this kind of thoughts on smart cities, green roofs, etc. But how effective are they actually under climate change? How can we make sure that these transformations that many communities propose are actually working? And then we hope that we can move towards a more habitable earth for humankind. I think that was it for today. <laughs>
or that they're just so pollution, they create so much pollution that it's just not worth it. And whoever needs them should use an alternative. But part of the problem here is that people with disabilities are often unable to use the alternatives. Plastic straws were invented because they work really well for some things. So this chart here shows um, on, the, on the up and down in the rows, you see the different alternatives to plastic straws. There are plenty. There's bamboo, there's metal ones, there's um, ones made out of pasta. There's so many different alternatives, and I think that's great. And if you're able to use one of those alternatives, I hope that you do. But there are people who are not, and those straws become a medical necessity. These are friends of mine. These are people that you probably know. If you know anyone who has had a chest surgery, for example, for breast cancer, having a straw instead of having to lift a glass makes the person able to actually hydrate. Seems pretty important. Um, each of these alternatives has a problem that makes them non-ideal. And in contrast, you can see on the bottom, those single-use plastic straws are the ones that are able to kind of deal with all of those hurdles. So my suggestion here is that instead of trying to ban something that's a medical necessity, we should try to listen to the community of disabled people who are saying, we need this. We need these to continue to be manufactured. We can't always bring them themselves. So we need to have them in restaurants. At least we need to have them sold in grocery stores. I understand that they're not ideal and that they do pollute, but why don't we ban balloons? Why don't we ban any other uh, wrapping paper that we use that none of these things are medical necessities? That would be my argument for that. Another suggestion that comes up a lot is that you should vote. You should vote for people who want to do progressive climate legislation. You should uh, make sure you vote in your city elections, in your state elections, not just federal ones. And again, totally agree with that. I'm not arguing that you should not vote. I think that if you have the privilege to vote in this country, you should absolutely use it. But it is just that. It's a privilege. Not everyone has. So. The question of who gets to vote is changing because right now the Trump administration is trying to increase the cost of naturalizing, so of going from having a green card, being a legal permanent resident, to being a naturalized U.S. citizen. And right now it's somewhere in the $700 range and they want to increase it up to that greater than $1,000 cost just to apply. It's non-refundable and there's no guarantee that you will then get um, citizenship. So anyone who has voted when they have a green card are then um, completely ineligible to ever get citizenship. And if they have followed that rule and not voted, then they still have to go through this multi-month process, which is very expensive. And again, this cost doesn't include lawyers or transportation or missing work for the appointment that you need to um, go to USCIS to do all these steps. And so yes, you should vote. And you should also keep in mind that not everyone has that privilege. So I would argue that immigration and citizenship really are climate justice issues. So if you care about climate justice, I hope that you'll also work toward a more equitable immigration system, both in this country or wherever you live. So my challenge to you, to everyone, is that instead of trying to work for a marginalized community, instead of teaching a community, for example, saying, well, we just need to tell those disabled people about those straw alternatives. Trust that we know. We know about the alternatives. We know about the other options. And we're still saying that this is the one that works for us. And so I hope that we can all listen to all the communities around the world who are striving for climate justice and who can drive it themselves and don't need scientists to come in and say this is what we should or should not do. Instead, be thoughtful and try to work together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Esposito. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, it's going to be loud. All right. Uh, as the gentleman in the ceiling said, my name is Christopher Esposito, uh, and the title of my talk is Putting Eco-Geomorphology into Practice, uh, the Future of Coastal Restoration. Um, I am coming to talk to you from an organization called the Water Institute of the Gulf. Uh, the Water Institute is a nonprofit applied research organization in Louisiana. And our mission there is to help coastal and deltaic people plan, 
thoughtfully for an uncertain future. So a lot of the work that I do is bound up in that very idea, and that's true both in the work that I've done prior to arriving at the Water Institute, some of which will be in here, and the work that I've done since then uh, as well. Um, I'm going to start a little bit by talking about some of the scientific problems that I address and then how I think that they can be uh, expanded a bit to fit more clearly inside of this session, which is my, my view of the future. Um, I, I'm going to start by dissecting this title image just a little bit. What you're looking at here is what's called a crevasse splay. Right? A crevasse is a location where a river has broken through its banks and uh, has usually uh, distributed some, uh, some water and sediment through that breach. And often you get these networks of channels and marshes on the other side of the, of the levee, on the other side of the bank. And that's pretty much what we're looking at right here. Um, in the foreground, you can see the yellow, uh, the yellow outline channels. Those are the crevasse distributary channels. Um, the deltaic marshes, which I've indicated in green, don't really have any outlining, but you can quite clearly see them in the image. And then the original uh, trunk channel, the river, is indicated in, uh, in, in those salmon stippled lines in the back. And a lot of my work has to do with looking at the sediment transport pathways from the river into the network, so from the river that's the salmon, uh, salmon color into the yellow, and then between the, uh, the channels in yellow and the marshes that surround them. And this is, this is pretty critical to coastal land use planning. Uh, in Louisiana, this is really the whole ball game because a lot of what we're trying to do is choose which parts of that state, which parts of the Mississippi River Delta are gonna be able to remain subaerial, is what we call it, right? So remain actual things you could point to and call that a piece of land. And distributing sediment to the places that you're trying to maintain is part and parcel of coastal restoration in, uh, in coastal Louisiana. And managing these types of systems is exactly the kind of work that we, we do. It's the most important um, coastal infrastructure projects that are, that are on tap there. So I'm going to zoom in really quickly to one other really important landscape element here. And I don't want to hit it twice, lest it move too far. But I'm going to hit it again, lest I didn't. There we go. Um, so I want to zoom in on the river a little bit because what you can see in the background and what I hope you can see a little more clearly right there are the ships. And I'm using that as a stand-in to say that people are a very important part of this system. A lot of the work that's done in this system, a lot of the geomorphic work is actually done by people, whether it's by dredging or whether it's by active uh, creation of landscape elements like marshes and terraces. So when we as scientists attack these problems, we really need to think of these 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 anthropogenic uh, issues as, as, as a different piece of the, of the system that we're trying to investigate. So I'm going to, I, I'm going to sort of give my view of the future in a nutshell right here and then go into some examples from the work that I've done that, uh, that I think bring that clear in this session. Um, the message that I'd like to convey is what's written up there. It's essentially designing management strategies. So that is designing how humans are going to interact productively with these kind of systems enhances all of our other scientific goals. So if we really want to understand how these systems work, if we want to understand the ecology, we understand the sedimentology and the geomorphology, we really need to understand how the humans interact with it. So you can do that in a couple of ways, or you can think of that in a couple of ways. It can be either how humans interact with it because you want to subtract that effect out, or because you want to learn how to manage the system yourself. But the points that I like to keep in mind are that doing that make our work more relevant. That's pretty clear. They also make our work more fun because we get to interact with more people. And they make it more correct because we get a clearer view of what the system actually is doing at the moment that we're working with it. So I'm going to show two, um, uh, a couple of slides from the same place. A lot of my work is, uh, is, is tied up in those, those questions of sediment retention efficiency in, in coastal marshes. And so some of what I do is by looking at how vegetation affects sediment distribution throughout some deltaic marshes. Um, in a nutshell, these slides that I'm going to show here, this is an image taken early in a flood season. The, the, the marsh is flooded, but there's not a lot of vegetation there. This is a, a, an image taken later. There's a lot of vegetation there. And I pretty much run around collecting these samples to show how much sediment has, has accumulated and relate that to the patterns of vegetation growth. Um, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but if you do want a little more detail, there's a way that you could find some out tomorrow. Um, but managing those effects 
is exactly how we manage the coastal landscape in Louisiana. So I started this by talking about how important it is to engage with the people, engage with the practitioners, engage with the stakeholders that are actually using these landscapes and, and how important that can be to actually doing the science. So I'm putting up a slide here that shows a project that I'm, I'm trying to get off the ground. It's sort of halfway there at the moment. And what this has become is this has taken probably 15 or 20 different stakeholders. So these are community organizations, academic research organizations, uh, government entities. And we, as a collective, are trying to bring this together into what can be used as a landscape scale experiment of vegetation sediment transport uh, activity, right? And so this, this area is called Bay Denise. And hopefully you can see what I've labeled. I have three different pieces of it labeled. Um, the first is an engineered terrace field. So that's a place where people have actually gone to create more marsh in what was an open water location. And that was a, a, a dredged activity. So someone actually bought a dredge out there and built some marsh uh, in that place. The second is going to be a restoration vegetation planting, right? So this is where people, through you know, in great uh, numbers of, of, of uh, professional vegetation contractors and, and a lot of effort have actually gone out and planted marsh vegetation. Now the goals of these two things are essentially the same, to see if we can manage the sediment transport pathways in this kind of place. And the third, way over there on the left, is a naturally filled crevasse pond. These kinds of interactions are really important to doing any sort of controlled experimental study of how this kind of landscape works. It's also the kind of thing that only comes about when scientists are engaging very deeply with community members and stakeholders and people that are active in the landscape for reasons other than basic research. So I'm very engaged in this type of activity, very engaged in getting research activity into the hands of practitioners, but also very, very engaged in getting practitioner input into the hands of researchers. And so I'm simply going to end with two, um, what I'm calling young geomorphologists, please, because I think we were looking for goals here. To the scientists, seek out your stakeholders in your area, in your field, and invite them over for tea. They're usually very interesting. And to funders, if any of you are in the room, please fund those tea parties because they're very important to the type of science that we do and making sure that that science is relevant. And I am bang on for time. So folks, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Isla Simpson. <laughs> I was so good, all right. So I'm Isla Simpson. I'm a scientist at, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things I'm most excited about in the next few decades, confronting our Earth system models uh, with observations. So I think before thinking about the future, let's think about uh, where we've come from in the past. Um, okay, so think about where we were in kind of numerical modeling and um, prediction 100 years ago or almost 100 years ago. So back in um, 1922, uh, the planet was about a degree cooler than it is now. And that was the year when Richardson published his famous book, Weather Prediction by Numerical Process, where he advocated for using the equations in motion to predict the weather. And he fantasized about having these weather forecast factories, these massive theaters with thousands of individual human beings doing the calculation at an individual location on the globe, kind of all working together in unison to come up with a, a weather prediction. And so a quote from his book reads that perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the computations faster than the weather advances and at a cost less than the saving to mankind due to the information gained. Uh, but that is a dream. And so here we are now in the dim future of uh, 2019, and we've had major advances that have allowed Richardson's dreams to be realized. Computers were invented, so humans didn't have to do it. We've had advances in numerical modeling. We can simulate the atmosphere, and we can definitely predict the weather on the timescales that Richardson was thinking about. And now we have a whole other set of problems to apply our numerical prediction expertise to, and that's kind of the lower frequency evolution of the climate system under natural and anthropogenic uh, forcings. So over the last century, the planet's warmed by about a degree, and our, our models um, are capable of reproducing that if you give them the right CO2 and aerosol forcings. And now we're using our models to predict 
the future of the climate system. And so a real challenge is how do we know if we're getting it right? Um, unlike the weather forecast where you have many samples, you can test whether your predictions are correct. When we're talking about this lower frequency evolution of the climate system, we have we're very limited in the observations we can compare with. So we can try and have a process-based understanding and include all the processes we think matter, but a large part of that is comparing with observations. And so if we're talking about in situ observations for basic fields like surface pressure, surface temperature, maybe precipitation, in some regions you can go back about 100 years. Uh, for many aspects of the atmosphere, you can look over the satellite era record, so back to 1979 or so. And then many other aspects of the Earth system, there either aren't observations or they're only starting to come online. Um, and so if we think about Richardson's quote, I think we kind of have the opposite problem now. We have no problem advancing our models faster than the Earth is evolving. And the benefits of having these predictions really definitely outweigh the costs of producing them. But we kind of need the real world to catch up. We need enough observations to be sure that we're getting these things right. And so while there's a lot to worry about in the future, I think what I'm most excited about is just the prospect of having another couple of decades of observations to be comparing our models to. And I'm just gonna give a couple of examples. Um, so one is, is the tropical Pacific sea surface temperature gradient going to strengthen or weaken? So this is what SSTs look like in the tropical Pacific. It's warm in the west and cold in the east. And our models predict that under CO2 forcing, we should have a weakening of that gradient, that it will warm more in the eastern tropical Pacific. They do this over the historical record if you force them with CO2, and they do this uh, with projections out into the future. But we have some indication that maybe the real world is not responding this way. Um, and so I have a figure here from a paper by Coates and Karnaiskis where they're looking at that difference in sea surface temperatures between the western and eastern tropical Pacific. The red is showing an observational range, so there's observational uncertainty there. Uh, but the gray is showing our model range, and kind of depends which observations you look at, but the, the real world is kind of very much on the edge of our model distribution um, over the last century in terms of how this feature has evolved. So we have a few possibilities of what's going on here. One is that maybe the real world has responded to CO2 with a strengthening of that gradient and our models are responding to that incorrectly. And so that would have global implications for our, our future projections. Another possibility is that the real world just has more low frequency variability than the models do. Maybe the, the, the model's gray range should be larger than what we see there and it would more easily uh, encompass the observations. And then another possibility is that everything's just fine, our models are correct, but just what happened in the real world was a bit unlikely. So I think we're gonna learn a lot about this if we just watch this situation unfold for another decade or two. Another aspect is uh, multi-decadal variability in the North Atlantic. So if we look at sea surface temperature variability in the subpolar gyre region here um, of the North Atlantic, it's undergone pronounced multi-decadal variability over the last century. Uh, and this is more variability than we typically see in our Earth system models. They seem to be deficient in representing this amplitude of variability. And this is also connected to aspects of the, the North Atlantic jet stream and has implications for precipitation uh, in Western Europe. And we've also argued that the models don't seem to capture that connection with the atmospheric circulation either. So even if you give them the right sea surface temperatures, the atmosphere doesn't respond correctly. And so we have a number of things that look like they could be going wrong uh, in the North Atlantic. But one exciting aspect is that um, while our models don't recreate this variability, if you initialize them with uh, observation-based ocean states, they are able to predict that low frequency evolution of the sea surface uh, for about a decade. So we have the prospects of having decadal, skillful decadal predictions in this region of the North Atlantic. But there are many things we don't understand because we have a very limited view of this low frequency variability just with a sort of century long records. So is this variability internally generated or is it externally forced? People are still debating that. What's gonna happen now? Uh, was this large amplitude variability we've seen over the last half of the century, was it unusual or is that gonna continue? And then why do our models not seem to capture the connection between the ocean and the atmosphere correctly. And so I think if, if we have another few decades of looking at this, um, we'll, we'll learn a lot more. So to conclude, we've come a very long way in the last 100 years. We've had massive advances in numerical modeling, and I'm sure we'll continue to have that. 
but I think what I'm most excited about is just the prospect of having looked at the planet for a bit longer and confronting our models with those observations. And I suspect we might have some surprises um, as we continue to do that. Thanks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Savannah Cooley. Talk is part of a celebration of AGU's centennial. The invitation I received to give this talk encouraged me to reflect on the next 100 years for AGU. And frankly, I really struggled with that. It was difficult for me to think about the next 100 years when so much is at stake in just this next decade in terms of the climate crisis. What I realized is perhaps the biggest contribution that we as scientists can make to this next century will involve moving beyond what I call science as usual and taking action on the climate crisis in ways that we never have before. My hope is that in these next seven minutes and 16 seconds, <laughs> you will be inspired to join me in doing this. First, a disclaimer for my sponsors. I was born in Southern California, and growing up there, I witnessed extreme drought conditions and multiple family friends losing their homes from wildfires. This brought into clear focus the devastation of climate change. And at 12 years old, I made a commitment to myself to be part of the solution. Flash forward to today, I work in the Applied Sciences Group of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and one of the missions I work on is EcoStress, a thermal radiometer on the in International Space Station that collects high-resolution thermal images and that what we use to estimate evapotranspiration all around the world. And that information, along with other data from NASA satellites, I work as an applied scientist to connect with decision makers, particularly water managers and state and federal agencies, as they plan for an increasingly uncertain future. In my spare time, I am endorsement lead for the Citizens Climate Lobby chap uh, Pasadena chapter, and my biggest win so far has been leading a multi-chapter initiative that got the LA County Board of Supervisors to endorse endorse H.R. 763, a bill that's been introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives that puts a price on carbon emissions. And I can't really even put into words the feeling of profound fulfillment and joy that I have knowing that I contributed to making that happen. That's really what this talk is about. It's an opportunity and an invitation for all of us to step up and make a difference, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it can be a joy. The more I take action, the more joy I discover, and the more opportunities I discover to make an even bigger difference. For example, I'm actually in the process of reorienting my career to focus on climate mitigation strategies, particularly related to land use and agroforestry systems for carbon drawdown and climate stabilization. These photos show the uh, regeneration process from degraded land to a thriving shade-grown coffee system in Guanacaste, Costa Rica. The next few years are probably the most important in our history, says Dr. Deborah Roberts, co-chair of IPCC Climate Impacts Group. And of course, we've all seen this graph before, <laughs> but have we really let it sink in that science as usual is not working? We keep publishing more papers, synthesizing those papers into reports, and then allowing policymakers to set non-binding agreements. And in the case of the United States, subsequently leaving those agreements. All the while, our greenhouse gas emissions keep rising. To address the climate crisis, I believe we need to do two things. Number one, tell the truth. As scientists, we're trained to do this pretty well. Number two, we need to act as if the truth is real. And that's where I think we have an opportunity to step up. Acting as if the truth is real will involve moving beyond science as usual and claiming our right to be citizens. Just because we're scientists does not mean we cannot be citizens. I think there's an important distinction there that a lot of us might not have come to yet. And being, being in that role of acting as if the truth is real is something that I think we have an especially important obligation to do as scientists. 
as the, quote, experts, what message are we sending when we keep flying around the world to our conferences and failing to even get our own institutions to make meaningful changes? Take, for example, the fossil fuel divestment campaign that I was a part of at Clark University. We only had one faculty member on our team, and not even the Board of Trustees Subcommittee on Social Responsibility supported our effort. And Clark is a pretty, pretty liberal university. So I ask, what will it take for us to act as if the truth is real? It will take courage. The root of the word courage is cor, the Latin word for heart. I'm asking each and every one of us to step into our hearts and see our emotions as a strength, not a weakness. It's through connecting with these emotions and making them conscious that we can take the action that is so desperately needed. And of course, we'll still be able to conduct quantitative analyses and use the scientific method as a tool. Our emotions will not get in the way of that. In fact, it'll help us ask the most important and urgent questions. It is courage that's enabling me to stand in front of you today with this message. The unfortunate reality is that the climate crisis has been politicized and I, I could have easily played it safe and told you about how we've re reduced uncertainty and evapotranspiration and left it at there, because that is really great and it's necessary. But I didn't, because there's a broader message that needs to be communicated urgently by each of us. As I go through these last few slides, I ask you to pay attention to your heart and notice what emotions come up for you. Even the most optimistic predictions are dire, says Dr. Marsha McNutt, president of the US National Academy of Sciences. And she's right. Even our best case scenario will deliver us a deeply damaged world. I carry grief for the hundreds of millions of people that feel the impacts of climate change already, both here in the United States and all across the world. I feel despair when I think of the habitat that we have lost, the biodiversity that we have lost, and it becomes almost unbearable when I also take into account the environmental degradation that we've caused. I ask myself, will I be able to look into the eyes of my grandchildren and tell them that I did my best, that I did everything that I could? Underneath, my despair and my fear and my grief is a deep love and connection to all of life. And it is that connection that brings me joy and that catalyzes me into action. That's my invitation to you today, to take action. There's so many ways to take action. Change your diet, give money and time to organizations that are part of the solution. Maybe don't fly across the world to give a 15 minute talk. Ask your institution to divest from fossil fuel and learn to maybe buy less stuff and generate happiness from within. All of this is contributing to a really important vision for the future. Can I please see a show of hands? Who in this room is willing to take action in one of these actions that I just listed in the next month? Please reflect on this and raise your hands if you're ready. Thank you. And joining together, we are contributing to a time in history that scientists will come and join the rest of the world in taking action and being part of what history books will refer to as the time when humanity avoided catastrophe and created a clean energy, sustainable economy. To do this, we need two things. We need to tell the truth. And most importantly, we need to act as if the truth is real. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Carrie Nichols. I think you might some, find some similarities between uh, Savannah's presentation and my presentation, so great. Uh, my name is Carrie Nichols. I'm an assistant professor at California State University, Northridge, um, down in Southern California. And I am here because everything is changing. I am a first-generation college student, a member of the LGBTQ community, a person who never thought that they would be standing on this stage or would become a scientist, let alone a professor with grant-funded research and mentoring students. I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. 
I work on the biology, physics, and chemistry of the ocean, and institutions are really finally starting to value interdisciplinary science in a way that I don't think was present a few decades ago. And I work in the coastal ocean, and the technological advancements that we've seen in the last few decades have really escalated our ability to uh, collect measurements and have increased both the temporal and spatial resolution at which we can learn about um, areas of the ocean and of the world. But everything is changing and we still have a long way to go. So I want everybody to take a moment and think about what is the number one challenge that you face in your career or in your science right now? Raise your hand if it's related to funding. Raise your hand if it's related to the ability to collect measurements and collect data, the actual doing of your science. Raise your hand if it's about time. Maybe you're overcommitted, not enough time in the day, the week, the year. Raise your hand if it's about people, the people you work with, the people in power, your students, people in general. And raise your hand if it's something else, or maybe all of those things. So I work on kelp forests, which are an incredibly productive ecosystem uh, found along upwelling systems around the world, and the productivity of these systems rivals that of tropical rainforests. For the last five or six years, I've been trying to learn as much as I can about kelp forests from all different aspects to try to understand if kelps might help uh, locally mitigate ocean acidification. And in doing this work, from collecting my preliminary data, writing my proposal, resubmitting my proposal, finally getting it funded to start collecting the data, I've watched this ecosystem that I love, both personally and intellectually, drastically change. The ecosystems that we are studying are changing faster than we can measure these changes often. And even when we have long-term data about these systems, the long-term data is not necessarily projecting and predicting what we're seeing presently. For instance, the warm water blob that took residence over the North Pacific a few years ago. And on top of maybe this existential despair that I certainly face, and maybe many of you in this room face, we're so stretched for time and we're being our, you know, attention is driven elsewhere by all of the factors that, you know, go into our positions. And for some of us, there's also a call uh, that compels us to rise up and to work to address sexual harassment, to work to address discrimination, to work to address inequities, not only for ourselves, but for our students. We've also suffered great loss. The first woman in science that I saw in a leadership position that I got to work with was tragically killed in a car accident on her way to teach. Two close women in science, brilliant friends and colleagues committed suicide. My treasured and beloved mentors and friends fleed their labs and their homes from the California wildfires. You ask me what the next 100 years looks like when I don't even know about tomorrow. So this is the mindset that I think a lot of us are in and some of us have been in, and certainly where I was a little less than a year ago when I boarded a ship with 80 women from 27 different countries as part of a uh, Women in STEM global leadership program called Homeward Bound. Uh, and so this program, Homeward Bound, seeks to elevate the voices and the impact of women in STEM fields who are going to be change makers so that we can work together, um, collaborate together, and build a global network of 1,000 women across the next 10 years. And in addition to the incredible professional development and leadership opportunities that I gained from this experience, these 80 women from 27 different countries have become my family, my, one of my greatest support networks. Um, and, and learning from the work that is going on all around the world has been incredibly impactful. There are incredible things, people doing, you know, making really amazing progress all around the world that sometimes we don't see because it's not uh, maybe right in front of us. 
And one of these women who had a particular impact on many of us um, in this experience was Christiana Figueres, who was the uh, executive secretary for the United Nations uh, Convention Framework on Climate Change from 2010 to 2016. And Christiana lives by this kind of credo that many of us have taken up as our mantra, um, in addition to just being an incredible, calm, calming presence and like every cell in her body oozes diplomacy, she abides by this sort of mantra of stubborn optimism. And it's this idea that we're not trying to deny how hard it is and what we need to do in order to make change, to make the planet more habitable, but that we choose to be optimistic because we know that solutions exist and we know what power there is when we work together. And that a better planet exists when we do this for all of us. And either we all win or we all lose. So ways that I have tried to kind of implement stubborn optimism in my own life and experience, particularly in regards to my career, is first to try to you know, embody that in my lab culture. Uh, simple things, even like changing language, this is something Christiana actually did in the orchestration of the Paris Agreement, was to purposefully change all of the language in all of the documents from a negative language to positive language. Uh, one example not in the documents, but that she sort of gave as an, an example of this idea was uh, instead of two, kill two birds with one stone, uh, plant one tree with two seeds. Um, so little things like that. Uh, also just starting to you know, lift people up in my lab group. Um, Secondly, to continue to do interdisciplinary work, but to now do transdisciplinary work and to, as Gabby mentioned, working with communities um, and building new collaborations. And thirdly, to really make sure that I'm aligning my priorities with what uh, will help me create the most impactful change and to try to not get distracted by the other things. Now, I'm not saying I'm optimistic all the time, but I'm working on it. Tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. This is a quote from David Bowie, who hopefully you all realize was an incredible musician, artist, and person. And the world in which David Bowie could thrive did not exist. So David Bowie created that world. He envisioned that world and he created it and he brought others along with him. We can't work towards the future unless we have a vision of the future. And we have a responsibility to co-create the world that we want to live in. So what do I see when I look at the next 100 years? Well, I choose to see a world that is more equitable, that elevates the voices of marginalized peoples and communities, uh, where science is at the table, um, and that the world is thriving and habitable. I'm here today because everything is changing and I hope that you will join me in creating that change. Thank you. Go. Ladies and gentlemen, here to close out is Elise Pendle and Catalina Oida. Wow, that was amazing. Yeah, I knew it was gonna be amazing, but I did not see that coming. <laughs> Well, I think I'm a stubborn optimist now, and um, I really am in awe. I am in awe of all of you, and I am definitely more optimistic than I was um, even just an hour ago. <laughs> I wonder if we can just have a huge round of applause for all of our um, inspirational speakers. Catalina, can you say a couple words? Uh, sure. So, yeah, I, again, I want to thank all the speakers. That was um, truly eye-opening and inspiring um, and encouraging. Um, and I hope we can all kind of take that as we move forward today, tomorrow, the next year, decade, and hopefully maybe 100 years if we're still alive then, but hopefully our uh, offsprings will be. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you again. Um, that was really wonderful. And thank the audience for being here. Um, if you want to speak with the speakers and continue the discussion, we invite everyone to just go over kind of behind the blue wall here um, where we can continue the conversation. And otherwise, um, the next session will be coming up in a couple of minutes. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you all.